So where were you the night of the 24th? <laughs> oh my God, this question, I can't respond. <laughs> so Davian, how you doing, brother? I'm good. I, uh, I really appreciate you doing this because I know you don't usually give interviews yeah. and it's not your favorite thing, <laughs> but I am honored that you agreed to do one with me. I really am. Uh, I'm going to shortly introduce you. You're a, a director and uh, uh, of cinematography. And you also, uh, I mean, when needed, you also do the, you're doing the filming. And you, without a doubt, and I'm not just saying that, you're actually one of my all-time, not just favorites, I would say that you're a big inspiration for me as far as cinematography and, uh, and your photography and just your ability to perceive the, the visual art. Uh, I know it makes you feel uncomfortable, but I, I, I mean that, so, so uh, I want to premise with that. And uh, you started... Um, how old were you when you started actually doing film and stuff? Uh, I started as, a, as an editor first, um, straight after school, like a film school. So I was 20, um, which is interesting because I never really have a plan or like a career thinking, oh, I'm going to become a director or anything. Um, I was an editor. Then I was still keeping an eye on the camera doing short films. So I'm still using cameras and filming but for personal project. And one day, um, a director I was working with and I was doing editing for him, he saw one of the film I did, like uh, just filming in India. And I gave him like the DVD of that film and he kept it in his library, like a good book. That's something wow. will look at it, just from me. Look. And at that time I had no idea of like uh, what you transmit in your image. I had no clue. I was just like doing it. And then I, I, I put it together with a sh short edit and some music and stuff. But he saw something in there that I could not see. Hmm. I was not able to see that. Um, and it's interesting because one day he has uh, like a big project. And the cinematographer he used to work, which was the best of the best, could not do the, the whole dates. Like it could not be available for the whole thing. So he told me, he says, you know what? That's long... I was thinking about this since a long time. I want you to film it. And it's when I start to actually be like a cinematographer, per se. But I still have no clue of what people could see. And, and it took me a long time and a long process to understand that, uh, that what they see, it's my sensibility. Um, which is weird because you can think it's technique. You can think it's just like operating camera. Um, and everybody would have the same thing, but absolutely not, which is amazing. You can give the same camera, the same place, the few people, you will have amazingly different results. Have you ever thought or, uh, like, did it ever come to you? What is that X factor that is different for different people? True as. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you think that through pain, we see more? Uh, let's say that um, I think it's a little bit the same like a blind person. They need to, they lose, a, like a, there is something that blocked. They cannot see. So they have an hypersensibility and other senses, um, which they will navigate through life. And I think trauma does that. When you have something that stops you to be, to, to, to navigate in a society as normal, like perceived as normal, um, then you will probably do struggle. They will give you another way to, you will need another way to express yourself. And for me, it started with guitar. The first time I, I, I felt that, it's my uncle giving me a guitar and I didn't know how to play, but very quickly I could express things through the guitar and it was very important. And even before that, I, I, I guess I did that with drawing. So I think those kind of things, you, you need a, like a, a field or somewhere you can express or you get crazy. Or crazier. So you're saying that when one one channel is blocked because of trauma, the it like is if you have like a jello in the middle, which is like our totality. Mm -hmm. So if you close something here, it pushes it from somewhere else, and that somewhere else is the creative expression. Sometimes for certain. Sometimes, people. yeah. I, I guess it depends. People are all different. Um, but what I see and 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 the struggle I think for artists mostly, it's they they all somehow. Uh, gather their, their sensibility in those trauma, traumatic experience. And that could be very tough when at some point in your life that become your success. Because what's happening, it's 
basically there is something that's uh, struggling in yourself to to comprehend the world because you you have a, like a shock or something a, a traumatic experience and sometimes it's not even your experience sometimes you inherit from your parents grandparents or or things that when you're in the belly of your mother so let me ask you this so so this because obviously it's not an answer i was expecting but i think it's the answer we needed i guess because that's what happened uh which is because i was thinking more along terms of like you know technical terms like is it uh you know, when I asked you the question, what do you think is a dissection? In my head, mm-hmm. the the array of answers from which we could pick did not include what you said, which I love. This is incredible. And I guess in my head, it was more like, okay, over time, you you know, you have certain ability to understand framing better because you, you have a, a natural ability to perceive light or color or shapes or whatever. And then you went with like a completely, you know, and so, th- so this, so that's why I really want to explore this. So, the the part of the trauma, the part that is blocking the thing, would you you almost compare it to like a maybe maybe a bad comparison, but like a barrel of a gun? Like there's nowhere to go, so you go through that one channel that you now have in front of you. I would not say that, but um, I feel like it's a, it's a it's a need to to exist in some ways. We all need to exist. We all need to feel somebody, something. Uh, and when you don't fit, and I think this is where you can define artist or not, when, when you don't fit and you need to find a way to express the the, the difficulties or the, the sadness or whatever the feeling come with it, um, artists, they, they gather in there and they, they create things. Basically, the, the struggle is when, when you start making money from something that's, actually is something you should fix, it's a difficult circle you enter in. Oh. Because then, basically, you've been successful, so you've been congratulated for something that actually you're struggling with. And I think... So now you have to keep doing it. Yeah, and you have to, to continue to be successful. And, and there was some point, it's super interesting, because at some point I was figuring out that my, my sensibility came with those struggles I had when I, when I was a kid. And the thing is, my father, uh, because he started to to work on therapy field and trying to improve you, like yourself, himself, myself, uh, removing those traumas, taking them out of your body to be able to live your life, basically. But I was questioning him. He says, I was afraid. I was, if I remove the trauma, will I still be creative? And for me, it was a, a real fear. It was like, maybe if I fix my childhood, Maybe I won't need to express anything and I won't be creative anymore. I won't find this thing, this pressure to, to create. And I was scared of that. And he told me, no, the thing is right now you can create only from your struggle. If you fix yourself, if you remove the traumas, if you, if you heal your body and, and the, 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 the thing that's blocked in there, you'll be able to create with anything. So you can create through love, you can create through... Exactly. Because right now it's true, when I look at my work, there is a pattern and the sensibility, the poetry, it's also like print with darkness. And I can see that. And maybe people, they, they cannot really see, but they feel. And this is how you connect when you do art. I think it's the, through the emotion that you, you need to express and you put in your paint or in your videos in whatever you do. Um, and people connect to it. Because we all feel struggle, we all feel this thing, and so that's why we need artists. We need, uh, you know, people who do music and to to help us to go through life. Um, and so, so I'm glad my father told me that because otherwise I would be struggling still to to find a way to should I fix myself or should I just be like you know like a poetic cinematographer, someone who has a, like a view or something different. Because you look at what you can bring, right? When you when you walk in the field, there is so many people doing it. As you will question your place there. Uh, you will. Um, so so there was a different step in my life to figure it out that, yeah, there is a part of me that creates from my darkness. I embrace it. And when I do a short film, it's usually very dark. But also I can, I can try to fix myself on the side and, and I know that I can improve my possibilities. So... I really want to ask you about the the overcoming of the traumas. Mm-hmm. But before I do, when on a functional level, when you started creating something that other people enjoyed, 
Take me through that moment in which you created something, people look at it, they really enjoy it. For you, in that moment of, like you took the, the, the video, you edited it through the paint, right? But when people look at it, what, is, what does that make you feel? Validated? Does it make you feel like just emotional release, catharsis? Or what is that moment that you're getting something out of it? Yeah, it's a tough question because um, I guess I'm never satisfied. Um, I have this feeling after each movie I do that the process doing the movie teach me so much that I will do it differently already. Mm. So when the time I'm finishing the movie, I progress so much in my craft that I would want to redo it. But you can't do that. You have to finish. You have to put yourself at deadline. Otherwise, you'll never finish anything. So usually when I finish a movie, I'm not happy with it. Mm. Almost never. And but are you happy with the fact that other people find it? So it's a weird thing because I, I must say I have very hard time with compliments, something that makes me uncomfortable um, since a since very long time. It's, it's a shyness. I think there is a part of me that's very hate the... Um, the self-congratulating thing. The, the, the quality that have some like alpha males that are very confident and... Somehow I envy them, but I hate this. I hate to see this, like what the, the masculinity in its full potential. I'm I'm very a feminine guy. I describe myself as a feminine guy, and and for me these male things are like uh, toxic. And especially in our world, I think there is not much place for that anymore. So I I, I sometimes I'm afraid to to go there if I, I if I feel that I'm successful I'm I'm afraid to be like oh wow I would be like oh I'm good no I don't want to feel that way so I always navigate in sort of like a more gentle way to see I can do better and uh, no, nobody's perfect and, and doesn't matter actually and and when I win a lot of awards it's validating that the people or can see your work is valuable or it's, they get emotional, they, they, they find it uh, successful in their ways, in their words, but it makes me as much uncomfortable than happy. I think it makes me happy for the other ones, like the other people who work on the project that need that validation and, and live through that to continue to work and find more work. But for me, it's, it's almost like, like, like this thing I told you, you you want to work with your with your dramas, your traumas, but in same times you don't want to lose them because maybe you will be less creative. There is something weird about the, this all like a... the thing that comes up for me the most is is there a possibility in your mind that so you talk you I know what you're talking about the 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 toxic masculinity right the 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 bravado for, for the sake of bravado, mm -hmm. uh, but is there a version of uh, health, healthy masculinity in your mind? Like, do you see that that maybe uh, there's a way to enjoy the fruits of your craft mm -hmm. while at the same time also almost like imparting the good feeling onto others by uh, gathering communities together? Like, uh, the way that I see it, it's almost like the, the, the healthy masculine would be doing more of that, which is uh, um, c collecting together communities and helping people actually enjoy each other's fruits and, you know, like the the kind of leadership that is more about the others versus yeah. more about your success. Yeah, it's true, uh, definitely. I mean, I, I think it's all about your experience. And my experience with uh, masculinity was kind of like always somehow toxic, I guess. Mm. I don't know. Um, so I try to prevent myself to go that way. But I, I, I completely agree. The, the masculinity is not an issue by itself. It's uh, most of the time the context or or what it represents to you. And for some people, it's actually beautiful. So for me, it's like, it's like um, this consideration of like the qualities in life, um, where we all know that we should have a balance between femininity and masculinity, yin and yang, all those kind of things. And if you ask me, when I look at the society today, and, and um, I'm, I, I find it only masculine, like the qualities that carries all society in the capitalism, and I'm talking about the Western society that I know well, and a lot of societies try to follow that path, but there is different ways to go. But all society is really short viewing, um, always about competition 
like who is the, the winner, who has more, um, comparing each other and the short term vision always. And this is the masculine qualities, which could make sense when we were like, you know, uh, people in, in the jungle and living in tribes and you need this masculinity, you need those quality in men to provide, to be able to put themselves in danger, fighting the bulls to get some food or those kind of things. And the, the feminine quality were, were making sense too. But today, in all society, like the masculinity, the put yourself in danger, there is no threat right now. There is not a lion behind the door that will catch you and kill you. It's not happening. So where do you put that? And I think a lot of people struggle to use that, uh, the testosterone and the, the thing that you flow, that's flow with you. And a lot of people became like me, like became more like feminine. You can see that we have less and less, you know, big guys and it's, it's not as important. It, it's almost became like a, like a show off thing, which is interesting. It shows that the society evolved. But if you spend like eight hours a day as a guy behind a computer, sitting in a desk, you did nothing with your, your testosterone, you, this energy that's within you. And this is where a lot of people struggle after when they came back home and they might, you know, that's why we need probably to go to the gym or watching soccer or whatever. You find a way to, to use this and some people use very wrong way. But this is where I think we need to come back with a balance. And the balance for me is not like bringing women in that world as it is. Because the world right now is masculine. So the women who can enter it are mostly masculine too. Because all, whoever you are, you can fit wherever you want. But the qualities of masculine and feminine, the feminine qualities are more about gathering, long-term protection. And that makes a lot of sense. And we need that view in our society. We need a view of long term. This is what we don't have. Right mm. now we are looking at the climate with a perspective of men's society, with men choosing and taking the decision. And when I say men, I say people who carry the, the masculine qualities. It could be women. But we need to have like a second like branch or something different than leadership who would advise the society to make a long-term decision. And this is where the female quality will be perfect. And I would be part of it. So you say, so that's beautiful. So you're saying uh, you're using feminine and masculine in the ultimate sense. So like uh, in this example, a, a woman with too many masculine qualities would fall in terms of purposes would be a man because she's still reflecting the all the qualities that uh, we would attribute to the ultimate masculine basically. And then they don't really, they're not part of the solution. So I actually didn't think of that, of like the, the long-term, short-term, short term. I, w I would assume that it's a little bit more complex than that, but I see your your general point. I would say that the way that I see it is that I feel that there is definitely an awakening to everything that you're saying, and there's definitely a change in perspective and attempt. Uh, there's a different goal. Uh, um, there's different attributions to what goals should be pursued, and I feel like the long-term ones are something that are considered more seriously. It's just that I feel that this particular problem, let's say with global warming, and I'm sure there's other problems like that, uh, that are just, at the moment, they're just too difficult for us to figure out how to go about. So we don't really know. So we do the next best thing, which is, you know, virtue signaling and making paper straws or like, because we don't know what to do, right? Because we just, so we do something. And on the one hand, it's ridiculous because, you know, like, come on, like, just, can we just relax until we figure out a solution? On the other hand, it's part of human nature to try and at least feel like you're doing something it doesn't make it correct it's just mm -hmm. that that's the thing but i but i do take your point fully about the need to bring balance and do and the need to bring more feminine into the picture and i find some of your specific points very profound because one of the things that i feel that is being missed big time which is exactly what you're saying which is that you know you have the the hardcore uh feminists the women and they're the way they're going about it is so non-feminine. It's so like men in your face. I'm gonna. It's and it's it really goes against what what the uh, the feminine energy actually brings into the picture, which is the beauty, the 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 the, the you know the the sensual the sensual nature of uh, the present moment, like everything that has to do with the with the womb principle. Yeah, but I feel in the 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 state the society is right now. Um, 
I think we need all kind of um, shake, like shaking uh, moments, like so. Like shaking the system, you mean? Yeah. So I think those women are important too, because they will talk to certain t type of people, certain type of men or women that will uh, understand them. So we need, I think, to change the system uh, to hear a little bit all the possibilities um, to shake things up. Because if you wait that the gentle femininity move itself in the society, it's not going to happen probably. So sometimes you need like a, you know, a vessel or something mm -hmm. that will push the boundaries in many ways before we can find out, oh, okay, the, this is here we want to go and it's okay. So the way that I view it is like the, the true like power of the femininity is not even gentle. It's in the control through the subtle. So maybe control is the wrong word, but influence through the subtle. Mm -hmm. So like if you notice one of women's strongest qualities, either we like it or not, is their sexuality. Mm -hmm. And because it can influence men in a, in a complete way, like it just, it can move mountains, right? So behind every, you know, Jai in general, there's like a woman that can just move them and like with just a little bit of a... So it's it's the influence through the subtle. Yeah. So the subtleties. So I don't know, and it, it just might be a, a language thing, but like I don't even think that women necessarily have to be gentle, but they're much more subtle. They they, they see much more of like the, the, the little, you know, intricacies of the structure. And that, if you ask, if you would ask me even before we would talk today, that would be the thing that I would say is missing the most in the system which is paying attention to the subtleties of what actually it means to do something in the world. So for example, it would be much harder to do everything we're doing to rainforests and to the environment if we would be sensitive to the subtleties of what it's doing in the larger picture, which is like how it influences the environment, what it does to the, to the uh, local cultures, like how that influences the balance of the, of the actual energy. Yeah, the, the, the main thing I think is the long-term short-term it's um, what's well, it's the obvious, and for me there is no trouble to have men leading stuff. This is actually what they're good at, but I think we need, like you said, the subtlety and like this feeling of becoming something on the long term. We need to include that in the decision of our society. Right now, it doesn't exist at all. It's only people who are seeing the world as yeah. how we can take the most of what we have right now which is absolutely the wrong way to do. The things are not uh, illimited and we know it and there is no excuse. There is everything is there, the, the, the numbers, the, the, um, the scientists and everything were proven right since 60 years that we are doing the wrong thing. So the society need to change like deeply and bring back femininity. And, but this is where it's interesting and, it, it, and people can be offended because they, they, they could think, oh, they want to put more women. It's not about that. It's about bringing the quality of femininity, bringing the balance back and having both in place and, 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 and doing things. So women could make choice for long term or femininity and men can be in the actions things. It's fine. So, yeah, I mean, uh, to be quite honest with you, the way that I view it is uh, I can only view it, obviously, through my own experience. And my experience tells me that the thing that is missing now, aside from everything we said with the subtleties, is the, the, the middle point of true balance. Because what I'm saying is that it's just that in order to get to the ability to see long term, you can't have too much thrust in the moment because it actually blocks your ability to see further. And extreme views are a form of a very strong thrust, which prevents you from actually seeing it. So... What I'm saying, for example, mm -hmm. a perfect example is like Greta. You know, Greta, the Swedish girl, was like, when I saw it for the first time, I was like, what's happening? And then I was like, I understand that some people believe that there's a necessity to like, oh, now you're going to listen. And I don't know how many audience members I'm going to piss off, but uh, no, you definitely don't need that because this is, a, this, is, this is theater. This is a charade. And what we need is authenticity and realness. There's not one instance that is so of Greta. I have nothing against her as a person. Um, I, I respect her courage and everything else. But on the other hand, she was placed in a position that obviously, you know, many kids would like to be in, which is lecturing to adults. And so it's not that difficult, if you ask me, first of all. Second of all, it's uh, all of it is a show. All of it. I have not seen one time that she spoke that it was not a theater show. And the reason that I'm saying that is because 
what this creates is a certain uh, movement around this energy and people are rah rahing around it and it's very infectious but if you notice that is exactly the masculine energy which is like gathering around the thing and pushing it so what is needed is the ability to like take it down a second okay what is happening here what is happening here you can't just get off fossil fuels just like that because the world will collapse right so you got to be realistic about things too and there are certain people in the world that will always take a certain situation and will try and pull it for their favor. That is absolutely true. But the best we can do is to take what we can from like a more like tone it down a second situation. And then what we can actually move in order to even eliminate the need to pull things in your direction. Because you will have enough for you. You will have enough for me. And that the way that I see it is that's, that is the expression of the feminine that I'm seeing that is missing, which is the mother when you come back home and she sees that you had a really crazy day. Uh, it, it, I guess it's more encapsulated in the grandmother, right? And she would just sit you down for, for a cup of soup. And there's this just like, and from that place, solutions will come to you that never would when you were in the meeting before yelling at each other about what you think is the best idea. You see that, that I guess that that's where the nuance is for me. And Do you see what I'm saying? Of course, and I think you bring up like something that to me is obvious is the the, the beginning of all of this is fear. When we start to get afraid of something, we lose control. And and men in history and time, we we play with that fear, and we we sometimes forget to to take it as it is, as, as like a signal or something that should help you to navigate. We we take it as a threat. And we want to cure like a fear, like like pain. You want to cure pain. You don't want to feel pain anymore, which is kind of like crazy in some ways. Because if you reverse the process, you for me, for example, now, if I don't express fear or or anything that can, I'm I'm feeling that I'm stuck in my life. That's mean I'm not moving forward. I'm not doing anything new. Because the fear is this feeling is when you do something you never did before and it's actually very exciting and you can re you can change it to from fear to excitement. But if you're scared, you just don't do it, or you 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 stop yourself to evolve and then you you basically screw yourself over time. And I think a lot of things are uh, common to those things. And and pain is probably the same thing. It's a signal that tells you something, and most people will take a pills to not feel the pain, which is probably the wrong thing to do. Mm. Yeah, I think you nailed it. I think it's the difference between fear and love. And, and yeah, it's expressed so many times and it becomes banal, but that's actually true. Like you, when you, again, yell at each other in a meeting, that's fear. Yeah. When you rah rahing around against other people doing s s things a certain way, that's fear. It's a very different place where you just sit down and have a communion mm -hmm. and have like, hey, okay, let's talk. Yeah. That is a very different kind of modality that brings very different kind of results. So from that, I can tell you the the story I experienced from money and, and the fear I have from there and the way it impacted my life and the way I had to fix it to to even survive, I guess. Um, because uh, when I was young, basically my parents had like a, a huge bankruptcy and they went very poor, very poor for a time. And it was scary, but they decided to do like most parents at that time to basically not say anything to me and my brother to protect us, which is, you could think it's, it's, it's a way to go. But for me, we, I'm very sensitive and I can tell you my brother react completely different to it. But for me, I was very sensitive and it's, it screwed me over because I could see my parents crying. I could see the furniture disappearing. I could see the stroke and I could feel it. I could feel everything. But there was no word. No one, no one told me anything. So I kept this deeply inside me because there was no response to this fear. Something is wrong, but nobody, everybody tells you, hey, it's fine. Over time, when I started to walk on my own, something very deep like emerged. And I could not talk about money. No worry. I was tuttering. I would naturally find when I get out of the school, I start to work for the company that was the greatest and the one who paid the least. And it's not like randomly. It's like, the idea is like my parents, by not giving me the words that I needed to hear when I was young, 
basically they printed in me that fear that was not mine. This fear of money it was not mine. It was a confusion in myself. And I kept it inside. And when someone had, when I had to talk about money on my own, this was like coming back and was interfering with my, my own thoughts. And it was like for a long time, it was very difficult because I, I would not be capable of saying, no, I don't want this. No, I, I deserve better. I would not. While I was talking to the person, you could say anything. You could say, okay, we have this movie. I will give you two days to do it, but I know I need four. But I would not be capable of saying anything. Says so like, okay, and I would try my best to do it in two days, even if it's not possible. But when I was coming back home, working home, then when I was not in contact of the person, in this relation of energy between people, I could then think and says, oh, I should have not accept that. I should not let, let him like step on me like that. So it's interesting because there was this fear that my parents, unfortunately, not voluntarily put in myself. And, and the way that I was like going through life was repeating this fear over and over, not, com not comprehending it. And this is where I've been very lucky because my parents, after this episode, they, they try to find uh, different ways to, to fix yourself, to understand where your fears are, how do you keep them inside and how you can fix them. My mother became a massage therapist, which is important because she connects the body and the, the mind. Uh, and my, my father was like doing some research on many things. And, and for a very long time, I was like, denying everything they would say. I would say, you're crazy. I was pretty sure they would start a cult at any point. <laughs> it was like scary. They went through a lot of weird experiments and things, and I was against everything. But one day, I could tell that they changed my life. And the first thing I saw is when I, uh, through school, when I was not walking, I was not serious at all, but my brain was stuck and was not capable of listening to the, the thing that when you don't like the teacher, you don't, you can't, you can't memorize anything. If, even if your brain can, you just block it. Those kind of things. And I was a lot of them. And I was like very bad at school, very like average everywhere. The only thing that saved me, me was sports and drawing. So the rest was. Very what was the first one? Sport. Cause you were, I don't mean to cut your story, but you were actually rollerblading pretty hardcore, right? It was, um, at some point, yeah. Uh, um, Later on, I think it's the step when you need to destroy yourself. We all go through that. But we can go into that later. I, I was just like, uh, yesterday was showing me a video and I was so impressed. So it was, <laughs> yeah. it was amazing. Yeah, people usually, they don't expect what they when they can see from me. And it's another topic where um, where I change later than when you change usually. Usually you change when you develop yourself between like 12 and 18. I change after that. So there is a big disparity between who I am inside and who I am outside. And sometimes it's very confusing for me because I changed so much later on that it didn't impact like my external shape. Um, and I'm still carrying this body that, you know, like was under my big brother and shy and not capable of going through life with tons of fear that I was carrying on. So to come back to the, to the, the fear and what my parents did and, and how they start to help me with my my experience through money because they started to understand what was happening and they told me, they explained me, yeah, we, we've been going through this at that time and it impacts you now, which is super important because most of the time you, you come back to something and you don't have the answer. Nobody will tell you, oh, this come from there, which is hard to connect because what I was experiencing was just me and this guy talking about money and I can't figure it out and, and he will screw me over, over and over. So. Because I'm working in film industry, I had to deal like every single week to a new contract, a new, a new moment to talk about money. It was very, very painful. But my parents start to, to work on, on, on those moments in, in, the, in my life and they work on themselves, which liberated a lot of things. So, so my father was explaining me something that's the, the basic of it is like we are vibrating. Everything vibrates, but we, you have your own vibration. And every time you have like a traumatic experience, 
you might alterate this vibration. It might like vibrate like, you know, like not perfectly in circle. And this creates like energy. This creates something. Energy is probably not the right word. It's used for many, many things, but it doesn't matter. You send a message. You send something. You There is something coming out of you with this message. And basically, what, what I feel is like, your body is sending a message to the world. I need to fix this in me. And it, it, the world will bring you back what you need. But it's mostly a thing that will be very painful because it's over and over the same thing that you would try to avoid naturally because it's painful. And this is why it's super interesting. And you can turn things around and say, oh, I'm repeating that. I have something to fix rather than I will need to like, you know, go somewhere else or try something else. It's actually a good sign. But the, the, the idea is to, when you remove the fear and you remove the traumatic experience in your body, and you, you come back to this vibration, then you, you don't send any message. And naturally, you won't also receive message from others. If you, if you have your own vibration, you won't be affected by like the, the energy that others sent you. You're literally not oscillating in the same frequency. So you're not, yeah. it's almost like you belong in different worlds. Exactly. So it's like goes through each other. If your fears kind of like match up, they will be very strong. And it's also part of the relationship we create with when we fall in love with someone who think we're in love. It's sometimes because this person responds to a big trauma you have, a big trouble that you need to fix. And if you don't understand that, you might have like those very strong experience, very physical, like you love that person. You cannot do anything without her or him. But it's actually very destructive if you don't fix it, if you don't work on it. Um, so what my father tried to, to tell me and, and help me with this money thing is like, he told me, don't try to control it. Don't try when you, when you in the room with the guy and start talking about money and you, you feel, try to feel what's happening in your body. Try to identify where it's happening, how you react. Is it your, your lungs? Is it your brain? Is it your legs? Whatever it is. And I start to do that. And it was incredible because I could see like the guy would start talking and my brain would my brain would close like a, like an oyster like so basically you, you, your perception just like shuts down and it's just like yeah Phew. and then i cannot really respond to anything and i'm in this thing where my body take control not my body my fear and that was interesting because my father told me if one day you get rid of this it's gonna pass through you it would be amazing and i was like eh, yeah but the truth is because they were working on things and and pushing me to work on those kind of things and my father has this ability to talk to your body. He, does, he doesn't even talk to you. He, he's feeling it and he said, oh, you, you need to repeat this again in your, in, your, in, your, in your mind that you don't need that fear here. And, and it was like helping me a lot. And in, in a range of two years. Sorry, I, I'm, I, so, I'm so sorry I'm cutting your story, but this might actually be super helpful for people. So maybe just pause for like 30 seconds. Like what is it? Maybe people can use it. So you repeat like a mantra? Like no. what? It's more like, um, actually, I, f I don't think the, the, the sentence matters that much. I think the most important is to, to, it's almost if you talk to your body and you say, I don't need that fear right now. It's not mine. The most so if you feel like a thing. pressure in the chest, you go, I don't need this pressure in yes. the chest right now. And the best is when you experience it at the moment, because sometimes, you know, we have a delay. We, we, we are like, if you, if you stuck in thing, you cannot do anything you, you, you're living the, the, the crisis, let's say, and, and sometimes when you talk to someone, you, you don't, you can't think, you can't. That's why people sometimes they talk and they cannot li listen to each other. They can't because they just interact with energy and fear, basically. So in, in a range of two years, I could see an incredible changement. And it was like, the more and more I could be there, and I was I was capable of like, starting to feel my brain less, you know, like doing this, this closingness or something like weird. And, and then I started to, to be capable of saying, no, I know I, I, I need three days, not two. And it was incredible. And I start to, to finally see what my father was telling me a long time ago. And after two years, it was like, I could laugh at it. I could, the guy could actually try to like pay me low and I would be, no, I, I, and I, w I would take control of the conversation easily. And I could feel like nothing happening. I could actually see 
that he's trying to control me, but it doesn't do anything because I removed the fear. And the great thing is like, it was not even my fear. This is where sometimes it's so hard to find out like what is your trouble or how it's happening because it's not necessarily yours. It's not really yours, ex your experience. It's how you capture the world. And I'm very sensitive. So, um, so I have a lot of things to fix in this way. And this one, so after, let's say two years, I was like liberated and naturally I stopped working for that company. And naturally I start working with company that pay me more and respect me more. Naturally, I did nothing to do that. I didn't like seek for a job or whatever. Naturally people were aligned to these new states of myself, called me and I was working with better people. So it could show me how I was attracting them. I was attracting the thing that my body wanted to fix. And it was like incredible. But after that, no, not long after, maybe a year after, well, I, feel, I felt I was like, hey, great, I'm fixed. Not quite. There was another thing. I could not spend my money. And the final dragon. Yeah, I kept money and I was like, I, I, something wrong, I could not spend it. There was, and I think a lot of people feel that fear of spending money. And it's kind of weird because what do we do if we don't spend that money? What does goes it stays in the bank account sometimes it's so weird and i have a friend which very interesting um, person in my life very important he's, a, he's from south korea he's been abandoned in a train when he was eight and adopting friends and he has a, a different way to see the world and to experience and to go through it and i love to just watch him how he interact with the world um, and that guy, which is so wait, wait. So he was abandoned in a train when he was eight years old yeah. by his father yeah. in South Korea, yeah. and then he ended up in France. Yeah, he'd been adopted okay. in France. Um, and that guy, which I knew since uh, many years, uh, come with me with a with a script with a, a film he wanted to do, and the story is basic, but the way he wanted to do the film was super interesting. So the, the basic story, it, it's something like a guy has forty years old. He has a daughter, a wife. He never did anything in his life. He never experienced life. He never took any risk. And he has the very normal shitty life that people want in print. And then this guy just about to learn that he has a brain tumor and he has three months to live. And from there, this is the movie is about the decision this guy has to do because now it's time to live. You have only three months. And so my my friend, he wanted to tell the story in a very weird way. He wanted to, me filming the story, him directing, he wanted to take an actor and go on a road trip and basically ask the actor to act all the time as he's about to die in three months. And and we, will, we would film the real reaction of real people in front of him. So it's like a documentary, fiction, like narrative, it's a mix. And for me, it resonates so much with what I have right now. Like, it, it was like, if you have three months to live, what do you do? What do you do? You definitely don't save your money. Yeah, what's the point, right? Except if you have kids, maybe it's, it's a question you can ask. But for me right now, I, I, was, I knew this fear of like not capable of spending my money. And I knew that I have to face that fear. That was my... The last thing I wanted to do, and without the help of my parents, I wanted to to do something meaningful. And for me, at that time, if you if you ask me what you do with your money, if you have three months to live, my response would have been, I would buy some adventure. So my friend is just offering me an adventure, and I'm, I'm I'm like, you know what? You will never find a producer. You don't have a story. You don't write anything. You have a beginning and the end. The end being, this guy wants to die in nature. And that was it. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to pay for your film. I'm going to pay for the adventure. And it's going to be painful, but I, I will embrace it. And it has been painful. We start to, like, each hiking, three guys in the middle of France. And we went all the way from France, England, Scotland, and we end up in Iceland. And we've been giving crazy shit because I did add money, but not enough. <laughs> Really not enough. So there was a lot of things that we were struggling with, and and we could not afford to have hotels and stuff. So we were like camping like under bridges, 
and sleeping in a car like we spent like 20 days three guys sleeping in a car and it was like very hard for everyone in, in, involved and there was a lot of tension but to see my money going away day by day and arriving in in Iceland basically we we started the, the trip in France and it was summer it was very hot we arrived in Iceland it was the end of October it was freaking cold and we were supposed to buy new stuff. We were supposed to buy new sleeping bags because the one we have are clearly not made for that temperature. But my car didn't work. It was the end of it. And by luck, we had just like, we just bought like some food that we put in the trunk of the car. But we spent, I think, like 10 days eating like bread and mayonnaise. And, and almost the first day, we, we really thought we would die. Like we, we took the, the, the actor that's older than us, the morning he was blue. We have to shake him up. We, we thought he was dead. It was like super scary. Wow. We'd been lucky <laughs> because the weather had been incredible for those two weeks we've been there. But the, the tension of the money and not having money. And even if you know that you have like the flight was paid by the, the pay in advance. So we knew that we will come back. But wait, but nobody could. You couldn't pick up the phone and say, hey, to your parents, like, like, I, I, I understand it's, it's not part of the, 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 the hero's journey, but you know, you were there, like somebody almost died. You don't think, okay, I should pick up the phone and call somebody and say, hey, can you send us t t uh, money for tickets <laughs> or plane tickets? You know? So we never really thought of that, actually. <laughs> for us, the, the thing is, we were like, okay, we have food, whatever it is, like, junk food and it was like mostly like those Chinese pastas like noodles uh, and, and some bread and mayonnaise and, and we were like let the, I don't think we ever think about this true huh. we were just like living the thing and we were on the world since so long that we were feeling like we were that was just us that's the life the world it was very very weird um, I never felt that close to be homeless and to understand how you can lose your mind like one day I was like driving in Scotland. I think I drove for like six hours and we were long gone in the process and we were like very self-isolated. Even if we wanted all the time to meet people for the, the movie, to, to, to film the movie and having people interact with us and with the actor. But we were mostly alone in this trip and mostly pressure, like giving us also the pressure that we need to achieve something. It was very painful. But after six hours of driving, I was like so tired. I remember stopping driving, parking my car, opening the door and lying on the floor. And people had to walk over me to continue their way. And I, what was that? You just gave up? It was like a... I was like, I, <clears throat> it was a weird moment. Like I didn't give a shit anymore. Like to nothing. Like people have to pass over me. Like it was like the weirdest thing ever, right? If you have a, some, any sense of civilization, you will, you know, move aside. No, I just opened the door and I just like lied on the floor. And people have like to step over me. And I was like, at that moment, I think I understood how you could easily disconnect yourself from all of that in really easily and then be in your own world and don't give a shit about it. That would be a great shot, by the way. Like an aerial shot of you stepping out of the car. <laughs> yeah. I think the actually the the movie would have been the behind the scene of that movie. That would have been an amazing film. There were so many things happening. I can I can't tell you everything now. But... <laughs> it was like a life changing experience and the the conclusion of it, it's like when I came back to France, I was liberated. Like I never since then have like any fear of spending, having money and money never became an issue anyway. And we have those jobs that are not sure. We have those long periods without walking. We have those uh, uncertainty that's constantly there. And I have a lot of friends that stop doing this work for that because it's... You're talking about the film industry. Yeah. It's too hard to under. And... For me, it was so amazing that I could go through all this process, helping, helping with my parents that start the work and helping me to understand, to feel and to, to remove this fear, to vibrate again. 
to to be immune to that very toxic energy that people felt and that I was sending back. And then to be capable to face my fear, come back to Iceland alive. And then after I was like, fine. And now it could it could happen that I, I, I don't, right now, I don't have any work for the next, I, I, until I don't know. I don't care. I'm totally fine. It's cool. Wow. And actually the peace that it brings to you, it's actually what's make the job capable to come back. There is nothing worse than coming back to the, like the, the, the prospect scene and when you you hungry when you, you people feel that you need you need money you you are struggling, but when you don't have the fear it's it's easy, and you don't even have to do anything. So to conclude that I would say that since since then and it's been almost like more, almost twenty years since then. I'm not trying to find job ever. I'm trying to find who I am. Because the more I'm aligned with who I am, the more the job makes sense. And things happen. And every year, there is someone from the other side of the planet that call me and say, hey, I have this job for you. And it's perfect. Wow. That is one of the most inspiring stories. I Because um, you told me this story. And I asked you to tell me this story on the camera. This is uh, such an inspiring story because... You either see it in movies or somebody tells you about somebody who like, but when a person tells you, no, that's what happened to me. There's like a, there's a different weight there. There's, it's almost like you, you, you know, it's not even the romanticized version of it. It is what it is, which is that you committed to pay for your own adventure because you knew that that's the way for you to handle that fear of spending money. So you're going to do the, the most extreme version of that which is spend money indiscriminately until it's gone and you don't even know what the outcome you know there's no nobody promised you anything at the end of it it's just like you 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 quite literally jumped off a cliff yeah. without knowing what's at the bottom and at the bottom was you came back and there was no more fear of money and and and, and as a result of that you always get the jobs and not only you always get the jobs, you always get the jobs that are perfect, perfectly suited for your deepest understanding of yourself in that moment. Yeah. That is one of the most magical stories I've ever heard, seriously. And you know the crazy part is my friend that direct this film, he never finished it. <laughs> he's still, if you ask him today, So it's his limitations, yeah. If you <laughs> ask him today, we'd still tell you that he's working on it, which is... is wow. It's, I think it's part of his story to not finish thing. And the few short film he finishes because I did editing and I finished it for him. Um, but every time I'm telling that to people, they, they, they see through, they see this through their, their own way to absorb the things in general. And they're usually mad at him, like saying, oh, why well, you spend your whole money for him? And he didn't finish the movie, but it never bothered me at all. Because I never did it for the film. I did it for the adventure. And quite frankly, I've been paid, you know, a dozen times for it rather than seeing a movie that actually it's been so many years now that I don't even want to see it. You know? <laughs> I'm filming with different. It films. would be interesting to, to revisit. Yeah. Exactly. Like at a certain point, um, I'm almost interested in. Uh, um, if, if if I ever in the near future get to like a a certain level of fortune, I I would actually would love to just pay for uh, to an editor to like finish. This. this would be really interesting to watch. Well, why not? I don't I don't like yeah. it's it's happening or not. Yeah yeah yeah. So it's he, no, I think it's his story um, that he needs to fix because I think the fact that he cannot finish it, it's part of his his story. Yeah. Um, I, his I, mechanisms of repeating things and not finishing. I actually didn't know that that's the same guy that was abandoned because you're also writing, you were writing a movie yeah. about him, the, which is another, I didn't know it's the same guy. Yeah, same guy. That's very interesting. Yeah. So one thing, so one thing that came to me when you were talking, uh, because you used to do the rollerblading stuff, mm -hmm. that takes a lot of courage or at least physical courage. So how do you connect that to the fact that you were always afraid? Is it that you were just afraid from different things, but you weren't afraid to get hurt physically? So I, I don't think it's so, so the same thing. Oh, okay. It's really not the same fear that you you would scare to hurt your body than having this deep fear that um, 
take control of you. It's really different to me. Um, and I guess the difference is probably about control. When I do roller skating and I'm taking risk and I do like very complex uh, thing on the rail and I know what I'm doing. I know what I can hurt. I know I can break my arm. I know I can, you know, I know that. Those fears that are made from our traumas or experiences, they are much harder to, to comprehend and to put like uh, what will happen to you if you if you don't so they them yeah. they're invisible to us yeah like you don't you don't quite see what I think so so for me it's really different um they are very different a little bit of fear but to, to you yeah what's interesting is that somebody who got hurt physically in a certain way when they were really young that's probably their biggest fear yeah and yeah. probably you can keep like a, like we talk about keeping the memory in your body and sometimes it can happen with a shock like you're driving, you're stopping at a traffic light, and you've been hit by the in the back. You can process that naturally, and okay, you've been scared, and uh, uh, I'm still alive, it's good. Or you can keep the fear, and every time you will stop at any traffic light, you will feel that fear again. And that's mean you didn't digest it. And I guess the body and the mind, have, both of them, has this role and must digest things. And that's why actually when you're anxious before an exam, you might be sick and your body needs, you know, to over digest and you probably, you know, to, to go to the restroom often and your body tr work for you at that moment. And, the, and this is where the, the mind should do the same, but we don't have the same comprehension, I would say, of what the body, the, the mind can do compared to the body because body is physical, the, 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 the like the chirurgical aspect of it, it's you can see it, you can fix it, you can you know change like a tune. It's fine. It's more complex about the mind because you cannot go there and change things. And we, we always know nothing about the brain, which I think uh, make it very difficult to to navigate on those fields, comprehend them, and and find that there is solution to them to. So you're saying the internal structures are much more complex. So it's a much, much more difficult terrain because in the physical world, again, you kind of have a limited things of things can, can go wrong and you're ready for them. So if they happen, you're like, oh, okay, expected that versus an internal world where the thing that can happen is so beyond what you even thought was possible. That and I think it's what you, it's invisible. This is the big difference because, okay, when you, you hurt your knee, you can see it. You can see it like there is like a, pain, you, you can put something on it if you want. Um, but when it's about a fear that you carry, it's really hard, it's not visible, and you don't, you might not even know that it's there. The, the sign are, you're repeating the same thing. Mm. So what my mother, she's working uh, with people to try to connect mind and body. And there is something always interesting, interesting she told me, it's it about the circle that we do, that we, you can find circle everywhere. In, you know, space or in microscopic things, it's it's all the same. It's very interesting. It's all connected, of course. Um, but when your mother gives birth to you, there are different moments that that are key, um, and there is fecundation, gestation, and birth. It's only three. There are many, but those three. Uh, can you repeat what they are? Oh, uh, fecundation, gestation, and birth. So what is the first one? Fic Fecundation. Fecundation? It's a, it's a French word that I say in English. No, I, so I want to know what it is. Procreation. Okay, okay, okay. So when... Fecundation. When the, when, <laughs> when the spermatozoid enter the ovary. Okay, yeah. Right? Yeah. So those moments are key moments that you will basically, that will give like, uh, like a pattern for you to repeat if something went wrong in that moment. And for me, for example, on my experience, everything was okay, but when I was in my mother's belly, she went to the doctor and the doctor scared her. He told her, oh, something's wrong. The baby's too, too small. It's not going to be good. And she started to be afraid. And of course, I felt it. I kept this inside. There was no way at that time that I could process anything. And I was connected to my mother. I was inside her. 
And what happened is like during my whole life, until a certain point when I start understanding it and fixing it, before that, I was every, before every single project, I was afraid. I was repeating that fear. And it's interesting because it's connected also to to the the position of the person who will give you that fear. So my mother was afraid because someone has like a doctor, so someone who's supposed to know someone authority. Any rate, like authority, told her something. Even if she she could tell in her body that it was fine, right? If she was trusting herself, it would never happen. But because there was this pressure of the authorities right on, over you, so the doctor says better than you, which is crazy, but what they do. And so she, she went in this state of fear and she transmitted that. And for me, it was the same. And sometimes I can, I, I could see the pattern between an authority giving you something or asking you to do, and then I would enter that phase of fear. And it was very, very hard because for my first, like, few months of walking, it was like before every single walk, new work, I would get sick. And then my parents start to work on those things, understand them, communicate them to me, and doing this process to understand, oh, what's happening in my body, and I could fix that too, which is amazing, because now I don't need that fear. And no, I can feel the sometimes the the anxiety before a project because it's no one. You know, your body try to prepare himself to something new. Which I, I told you, I think it's enjoyable now for me because I, I mean, oh, I'm about to do something new. It's great. But it 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 has been a long process to fix it. And before it was just a sickness that was horrible. And there was and my my life has been miserable if I kept that. If I like, quite frankly, my parents, they, they, they pass on me tons of bad stuff, but they fix most of it, which I'm very grateful. Which is amazing, by the way, because yeah. most people don't get that luxury. Exactly. They just had the tra- get the traumas from the crashes. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and especially if you, I think for any kind of traumatic experience that's connected to your parents, if they don't do the job, it's really hard to get over it. Because <laughs> if you see them frequently, it push you back to it. Oh. I recently, I'm going to tell you a super short story before we adjourn. Uh, my mom recently came to me because of the whole laser thing. And she said, I see that something is happening around it. Uh, and I see that I don't fully understand. So she said, I want to do DMT. And I said, okay. I was like, I'm not saying you won't be able to handle it. I mean, I, maybe I can't handle it. I don't know. Uh, so we talked about it a little bit back and forth and I said, okay, look, she was visiting. So she wasn't like far as she was there. I said, okay, how about we start with mushrooms? How about we put you through a mushroom trip? And because she grew up in Soviet Union, there was a, a lot of, as you know, propaganda. So just like, you know, the older generation, they all have some form of this idea that, you know, this is like drug, this is bad, this is all that. But this is on steroids because in Soviet Union, that meant you can lose your family, your life. Like that's, you know, you would be taken to the gulags. Like that's that's how bad it was. So the association, you can imagine, it's crazy. So there was some undoing we needed to do, which by the way, I have to say that I'm, I'm blown away by my mom's courage with that. But we watched some, you know, we w- watched How to Change Your Mind on Netflix to kind of like bring it down a little bit and see that authority like uh, clinical doctors and in hospices, they actually use it now to help people like really heal. And uh, But we went through this whole process. And then in the end of that, she did the, she did a pretty heavy dose. She did like three and a half grams. And I sat with her for eight hours and I was the facilitator, which was the most difficult thing I probably have done in my entire life because it not only, you know, the, the emotional connection and everything else, and we have our traumas. We had like a very complicated relationship uh, and I had like a big disconnect from my mom for a long time. Uh, we were already in a place where we were like already healed a lot of it and it was good, but still there was a lot of things. So that was really one of the hardest experiences for me as it was for her, because she had actually had like a really hard time thinking about this to her age, never, ever experiencing anything like this. And really what it does, it brings everything into view and all the stuff that she never dealt with. It just all came up at once and it was, it was really hard. Uh, physically, emotionally, everything for her, for me, I'm sure for her more because she was, you know, in the territory she doesn't understand. 
Uh, but at the end of that, like you're saying, if they don't do the work, what was interesting is that as I was sitting with her, I wasn't doing uh, any of the mushrooms, but she was on it. And every time she would tell me something, like a truth, something that she never told anyone else and it just comes out, I could feel it in every cell in my body because the weight was lifted from her. In that moment, I'm telling you, like, you know, the psychological school will come and say, well, sure, you know, you're in the same environment. Like, no, 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 no. I could feel it as real as you can feel someone touching your skin. The second she said it, it was like a weight lifted from her and I could feel it in my body because she's my channel into the world. So I could feel the healing happening in real time. It was crazy. And by the end of it, by the way, for all the skeptics out there, I want to give you a crazy data point, which by the way, this should be studied a little deeper, I would say, this specific thing that I'm about to say. She has a blood pressure problem. Uh, she's always hovering at around 160. She's taking medication. When we were done, everything subsided. We went for a walk. We came back. We measured her blood pressure. It was 120. And this was like three, four months ago now. It never went up over 128. That's a crazy thing. So now, obviously, you can say, sure, it's because there was a lot of psychological stress. And I was like, okay, but that's crazy. Yeah. So the, And she had it for years. So and, and by the way, she behaves differently. She talks differently. There's like a whole thing that was lifted that I'm just, I actually have a, 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 a mini mission now. I'm trying to create a clinic that would focus on uh, generational, generational uh, um, therapy with psychedelics. So like you bring parent and a child and you do them together but you do it with a facilitator with a professional so if this if this is what happened when it was just me and her imagine what can happen if you have a professional like you have a facilitator that sits and helps both of them you can fix entire generations this way this is uh you know so um yeah so so i i i just it, it immediately made me think of that when you told me about if the parents don't do the work um so damien i want to I want to, again, thank you for, for doing this because I know that this is not your comfort zone. Uh, so I'm very happy that you agreed to do this because I think you have a lot of great ideas to share with the world and a lot of wisdom. Just somehow, naturally, uh, well, not somehow. Now we know that it, it, a lot of it is because of your parents probably. But also you have the sensibility of uh, uh, this deep wisdom of understanding that we should not escape our pain. We should look into our pain as a, as a guide to see what in fact is telling us that needs to be addressed and what needs to be fixed. And it sounds banal, I think, at a certain point because Instagram is filled with all those motivational quotes and everything just kind of loses its meaning because you know that whoever putting the quote doesn't even understand what that means. They just put the quotes to get some likes. But, uh, but it's so true that I think that really re like reframing it for ourselves as a central point of understanding can really like do so much work in, in a relatively very short period of time if we pay attention more to what it's like to be us in any given moment without trying to constantly escape the the, the, the uncomfortable feelings that it might evoke in us in, in every moment. And that is something that, uh, you know, I, I think more people should pay attention to. And aside from that, um, uh, you, you you did a lot of projects at this point. You worked, uh, is still probably working for this project for uh, Natural Geographic, mm -hmm. right? Uh, where can people find your work? Um, most likely it's my website, which is daystech.com. Um, easy. So Instagram and the website? Instagram, yeah. Oh. Uh, no, I will put all the links, obviously. Yeah. But So yeah, everybody go check out your work because it's uh, it, re it really is. Um, I mean, I'm hoping that Every day that passes, you you create more and more other love. But on the one hand, I am grateful, as I'm sure many others are, that you uh, created no matter where you're from. Like even if it was from pain, because we get to enjoy the fruits of that. And it's true. It re like really your work uh, is not an exaggeration to say that it is breathtaking. It really is. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I know you're uncomfortable with compliments, but I think giving a real compliment what it's due is very important because I'm. When I look at your work, it doesn't matter how many times I looked at it before because I scroll through your Instagram a lot. There's something about those moments that is so profound. Uh, and this doesn't happen a lot. So I, I thank you for that. It's interesting because I cannot see it. <laughs> what You really can't see it? No, still. Really, yeah. So do I have the time to do another little story? Uh, of course you do. So the fun part is like my, my need to make like beautiful picture, it's actually a struggle. 
it's like because I cannot see the second layer that will be in any imagery that should trigger a memory. And why is that? It's because I think when I was young, there is this whole part of my life that I completely blocked. I blocked my memory. I don't remember much of my childhood. I have only memories of struggling and hard part and, and uncomfortable moments. I don't have any good memory in my childhood. And I maybe it's, I just know that I was sad the whole time for what I remember or for what I felt or for what's left in me. And of course, my parents would tell me, no, you, you have some happy time, but I cannot see any. So I asked them to provide some photo of me when I was young. And the only thing there is, is this horrible moment where it's like, I think it was a, a something important because I'm wearing the costume, like a suit, like as a kid. But you, you see that picture, you see a kid, the, the expression that I have at that moment completely blocked me because I can see it's, it's terrible because it's a darkness in this kid that make no sense. And, and I think that's probably why my parents didn't take a lot of pictures of myself because you can see something like if I was leaving something absolutely terrible, like uh, in, in, in very harsh uh, environment or something. Like you survived the Holocaust or something. Yes, it's crazy. When you see that picture, it's sad. And for me, I didn't want it to see anything anymore in that picture, right? So it's, I think it's blocked something. And then after, there was this moment in my life when I was starting to take a picture and, and I take picture of my, my girlfriend and I, I was painting Japanese symbol of her and doing picture of body parts, which not really look like, not really show her, but show part of her. And then anyway, for me, it was beautiful picture. I put them all over my walls, but I broke up with her. And a year after I still had the picture all over and people came to my place and I hear that many, many times, like, how could you keep your ex-girlfriend on the wall? And this is where I start to figure out something was wrong in my perception of the picture because I don't see my girlfriend. I see a beautiful picture. Mm -hmm. That's it. And then for me, you want me to suffer? Show me like a photo album, a family album, because I will see nothing as this memories in there. I would only see bad pictures, like wrongly wow. written, wrongly composed, and it's super painful. So I think from this moment when I plug the memory in the picture, the, me the picture needs to be beautiful. Otherwise, it, it, it just like horrible for me. And it's, it has been interesting for me to work on that because I need to tell story that are not always need to be beautiful. And it's something that I need to work on. Otherwise, I'm stuck to do beautiful picture. And so I find my ways and, I, and now I, I have this kind of like poetry way of filming things and and what I said to my second camera guy which is my friend Julian I told him often if it's beautiful it's not enough because anyone can do it if you see a beautiful landscape a lot of people will do the same friend so I asked him to do something more to bring like hide half of it just with it or, or maybe put in like in, in a corner or something that's unexpected and this is where I started to understand that I was feeling differently and I was, I needed to express imagery and beauty in a different way. And, but no, I know also that I have to fix it to be capable of filming anything, not only what I need to film, what I need to highlight as beautiful, because sometimes the story need like harsh, not nice. It's really more gritty. Yeah. So the, the next, uh, the next, the next internal project, are you working on it? It's a walking on. Yeah, it's it's always a work in progress, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> well, I, I. By the way, would you say that now that you, like, when you create, you feel it's more out of love, or does, is it more, or is it this similar? So, I guess I'm, now I'm more capable of um, feeling things and accept that they are not as pretty as I need. But it's uh, it still consume my energy. Still, um, like it's it's harder to do. Um, then if I just do my thing and it's it's nice and every frame I will do it's like photo it's like I take so much care in that frame to hide anything that I would not like this is insane like the thing that's passed through my mind when I frame something 
people will not believe it because there is so many, especially when you direct and you film yourself. Because I have to think of my subject, what is doing, if it's the right movement, if the light is correct, and if I'm hiding this little thing that has the wall color or the wall, that I would change my framing to. So everything is perfect. So the thing that is not crazy to me is that if you have the ability to see the perfect version of something, and I know you will probably resist that idea, but I, I don't think so. I think there is really like the perfect version of it, which we will never achieve. But the people that are closer to be able to see that perfect version, it's not that crazy to me that they will be obsessing around making it as perfect as they can because maybe in their subconscious they know that not a lot of people in the world can see that. So it's almost like their responsibility to bring that into the world, that almost perfect version of that image. But the thing that is the personal journey, I guess, is the also knowing that it's okay. Like there's, there's a limited amount of time and energy in a day. It should not be the end of the world, basically, if, it, if it's not fully there. Um, so yeah, Damien, again, thank you so much for your time and your and your uh, wisdom and your work. And uh, I'm gonna keep enjoying the fruits of your labor and I'm gonna very, very happily share all the outlets in which people can enjoy you as well. So thank you, my brother. Thank you.